are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 3.30. Stay tuned next for Making Contact. This week on Making Contact. Even in that situation where a worker is going to get paid everything that they were owed, it's still kind of a settlement because that worker has had to go through this humiliating experience. There's always a loss and a violence that's committed against workers that's a lot deeper than I think people really realize. Finding recourse for unfair treatment on the job can be challenging for some, harder for others. Day laborers are particularly vulnerable to exploitation. At the same time, union membership has been on the decline, and some labor leaders have been slow to respond to changes that began decades ago. And it's not obvious to people. It's not like a sledgehammer hitting them yet, though it ought to have been, and for some it was. But the mainstream folks just kept thinking, hey, we're getting our deals, we're getting our raises, we're growing a little bit here and there. They hadn't had a culture of organizing for many decades. This week, we look at how workers are organizing outside of labor unions and where traditional labor might be headed. In California, an estimated one in 10 workers is undocumented. In Los Angeles County, immigrants contributed to over a third of the county's GDP in 2014. This is according to a recent study supported by the mayors of Los Angeles County and includes the contributions of all immigrants with or without documents. Immigrant day laborers are some of the most visible and vulnerable to being cheated through sudden changes in hours, unpaid wages, and unpaid overtime. As Paulina Velasco reports, the workers who gather every morning at a job center in Pasadena are taking a stand for fair wages and dignity in the workplace. The Pasadena Community Job Center opens up at 6 a.m. sharp every day. A dozen or so men walk up to a rickety table to register. They're day laborers, people who get hired day to day to do jobs in construction, gardening, house cleaning, moving. They swipe their yellow ID cards through a card reader and their profiles pop up in a software program that tracks their hours for them. Angel is one of the center's coordinators. He signs the workers in and gives each of them a raffle ticket. So this is the way we, we do the raffle. So at 6.15, uh, we're going to pick up six names. We're, we're going to put those six names on a list. And those are the ones who got the right uh, to go to work, depending on the work. Uh, because not, 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 all the, uh, not all the workers fit for all the jobs that will come in today. Probably number one will, will know how to do uh, maybe general labor, gardening, and the employer requires somebody to put drywall. Maybe number one doesn't know how to put drywall. That's why we have number two. Maybe number two knows how to put drywall. And then if not, number three, number four, number five. And if no one of the list um, can do the work, then we open the the raffle for, for everyone in the room. And we call that a special raffle. The workers that win the raffle also get daily duties. Worker number one sweeps the floor, number two makes coffee, number three cleans the bathroom this is their center for many of them it beats standing on the street corner or the parking lot of the home depot waiting to hop on a pickup truck with a stranger here for one thing it's dry and warm there's coffee cream and sugar there are even ESL classes happening in the back room the center is part of the National Day Laborers Organizing Network or Endalon a web of 50 mostly autonomous worker centers across the country Cal Soto spends half his week here. He's an attorney and a workers' rights coordinator with Endelon. The corners basically have no negotiating power. Um, they don't have that space where they can stop and say, hey, what is the pay going to be? How many hours? Uh, what kind of work? Is it going to be really heavy lifting or am I going to be in a dangerous uh, rooftop? At a worker center, it really doesn't just slow down the process, but it makes that process more intentional. Uh, employer will come in and they'll have to say how many hours they're going to hire for. They're going to have to say what their salary they're willing to pay is for that day and exactly what the nature of the work will be. Day laborers or jornaleros might be working a different job every day. They don't sign contracts and they have no benefits. They rarely get paid overtime or guaranteed paid breaks. 
And very often, they just don't get paid. Cal Soto runs a workers' rights workshop every month at the center and teaches the laborers about their basic rights to wages, overtime, the right to file complaints if their pay is withheld. At the end of the workshop, he offers legal counsel for people's wage theft cases. He says there are about three claims a week at the center in Pasadena. And it does seem like every person there has a story. At a Home Depot, an employer that brought me on to a job ended up owing me almost a week's wages, almost $600, for which many people isn't much, but for us is a lot of money. And I never saw that person again. He disconnected his phone, he never answered my calls, and well, sometimes you have to give up on that money because you can't waste time calling to chase someone down when you have to keep looking for work. That was a worker named Angel. He and Jesus, the man sitting next to him, worked from the street corner for many years and just started coming to the center. They've ended up owing me one week, two weeks wages for large jobs like making fences, drywall, bathrooms. What they do is give us little sums of money. Here's $200. I'll pay you at the end of the week. The end of the week comes around and they don't give us anything. Monday we keep working. Tuesday we keep working. We tell them we need the money. They say, okay, we'll pay you everything this weekend. And when they don't, they've screwed us over for two weeks. We do it out of need, but there are people who take advantage of us. In the worst-case scenarios, employers will avoid paying their workers by turning them over to immigration enforcement at the end of the day. Jesus and Ángel aren't the only ones with stories. The week I meet Marta, she's waiting to be paid by an employer who hired her and a dozen other workers from the center to pack eyeshadows for a makeup company. The employer had promised to pay them at the end of the week. Some of Marta's colleagues had clocked 16-hour days. And when the weekend rolled around, the employer and his whole operation had disappeared without a trace. A few months ago, the owner of a burger joint got her locale shut down and didn't tell Marta, who had been cooking, cleaning, running the restaurant basically on her own. She owed her a week's wages, 57 hours at $12 an hour. And then there's the story of the family-owned Mediterranean restaurant whose paychecks bounced at the bank. Nos pasó otro caso también aquí, en un restaurante. Digo nombre. <laughs> Marta was hired to wash dishes at $9 an hour, so she went into work for one day. Not ideal, she says, but when you need the money. So I went for six hours, and he said, I'll call you later, because two others arrived from the job center, a woman and a young man. A few days later at the center, the man asked me, did they pay you? I said, no, I haven't gone to charge them yet, because they owe me, he said. What do you mean, I asked. What happened is that the man gave him a check and it was false. He says, I went to cash it in with a friend at the bank and it bounced. The situation escalated. The young man was owed lots more money than Marta. He tried approaching the owner himself, but the owner called the police on him. So the center organized a protest. Thirty workers went to the restaurant with posters, along with Cal Soto, the attorney, and organizers from Endelon. The owner called the police on them again but they allowed the workers to continue their protest peacefully. We waited for almost two hours, and he refused to talk to us. He kept refusing, and he closed the restaurant. And there we were, marching in the cold. We even brought some tea with us. It was so cold until he finally said he would talk to us. Marta walked in first, flanked by the attorney and the director of Endelon, to talk to the owner of the restaurant. And I walk in and he says, do I owe you? Yes, I say, for six hours. No, he says, I don't remember you. Like that, I don't even know you. He's that short with me. He grabbed some cash and I had to give him change. Six hours at nine an hour is $54. He gave me 55 and he says, here, keep the change. Like here for your Christmas. He was giving me one dollar for my Christmas present. I said, no, thank you. Here is your dollar. Take your change. I only came to be paid for my work, not for you to give me anything extra. For Marta, it's humiliating to have to request the money owed her like that. I ask her what it makes her feel to face these situations. Impotencia, rabia, de ver que nos hacen eso. Helplessness, rage, 
at what they do to us. There is so much we go through to come to this dream, this American dream that's an American nightmare, not an American dream. It's a nightmare because when you come here, you come with the idea that you'll make money, and we don't. If we went back to our countries and told people what we really went through here, our people wouldn't come. Our people wouldn't come here to suffer everything that we suffer here. Not all wage theft claims require the center to organize a protest. Sometimes a phone call from Soto to the employer is enough to get the person to cough up the couple hundred bucks they owe. Sometimes Soto files a small claims or wage theft case in one of the district courts in the region. Even in that situation where a worker is going to get paid everything that they were owed, um, it's still kind of a settlement because that worker has had to go through this humiliating experience of being, you know, abandoned at the end of the workday or told that they're just not going to get their money. There's always a loss and a violence that's, you know, committed against workers um, that's a lot deeper than I think uh, than people really realize, that people understand because there is that feeling of I couldn't even, I worked the whole day and then there was nothing I could do to get the pay at the end of the day. The worker center still has a long way to go. The organizers from Endelon insist on the workers asking for a $15 minimum wage, but for people like Marta, the need for any work at all is more important. A mí, ponerme mis uños, no me ayuda nada. Putting on airs doesn't help me with anything. So I go because I have to eat, I have to pay rent. I don't want to live on the street. You don't work, you don't eat. There isn't enough to live on. We have no privileges. We don't fight, we work. So the workers still go out for $9 an hour, $12 an hour. They still sometimes don't get paid. But they still choose to go to the center to find work. And as part of the center, they advocate for workers' rights throughout the city. Angel, today's coordinator. A lot of the workers uh, went to the city council to push for um, uh, raise the minimum wage and it was one of the campaigns that uh, the center was involved last year and we, uh, you know we, we passed uh, that um, uh, law here in Pasadena so it, we, we're part of this uh, movement too and, and we, we're going to keep fighting you know for the rights of the workers and you know having this place here in Pasadena is, is a great uh, asset, not only for the workers, but for the city. The next tool the Workers Network is preparing for the laborers to use is a bit more modern than the traditional picket line. It's a smartphone app that allows day laborers to clock their hours, take pictures of their workplaces, and geotrack their locations. The app also lets them warn each other of the employers that mistreat them or refuse to pay wages. But the Jornaleras app is barely getting off the ground in L.A., in the meantime, day-to-day -day work is getting more mainstream attention with the debate around ride-sharing apps and other contingent work. And people at the job center say everyone in the up-and-coming gig economy could learn from the experience of the jornaleros. For Making Contact in Pasadena, California, I'm Paulina Velasco. Unions traditionally barred entry by day laborers like Marta, Jesus, and Angel, mostly by requiring a social security number to join. But in 2006... The AFL-CIO and National Day Laborers Organizing Network signed a partnership agreement to support each other for worker protections. Situations like Marta's gave rise to worker centers that provide services and support to restaurant workers outside of traditional labor unions. I met with Kathy Huang, director of Rock LA, a Southern California chapter of the Restaurant Opportunity Centers. In this interview, Huang explains how Rock LA partners with restaurant workers and employers to improve working conditions and she breaks down the differences between worker centers and traditional unions. Labor unions, in a nutshell, seek to represent workers uh, legally under contracts at specific workplaces in order to enhance worker protections and enforce you know, good working conditions, as well as elevate the leadership of workers through that framework. Worker centers like Rock operate under a kind of a different sort of legal framework in which we don't seek to represent workers, but rather uh, we function as more of a resource and leadership center for workers where we support the uh, development of skills in order for workers to participate in meaningful discussions around policy and um, overall changes in the, in the industry um, through media as well as um, 
um, collaboration with different stakeholders, including employers and consumers. So how does RUC work in, I guess, in conjunction with unions? Um, so we we partner very closely with labor unions. Um, ultimately, we're all part of a broader labor movement that's pushing for not only the economic justice within our communities, but, you know, also broader issues that we're facing now, you know, that are more critical than ever including, you know, immigration, racism and discrimination, misogyny, um, and how that manifests, you know, in so many different ways, both in the workplace and in the community. And so we have different uh, partnerships within different cities. You know, here in Los Angeles, we partner very closely with several labor unions to pass policy, to provide meaningful um, opportunities for our members to enhance their skills through training and educational opportunities, and also to continue a thoughtful dialogue around how to address some of the biggest threats that the labor movement is facing today. What are you doing right now in your organizing work um, in anticipation of those potential policy changes? Mm -hmm. So a lot of our attention has recently shifted to rapid response, um, which is a response to the growing need of our membership to some of the threats that the new administration has put forward. Many of our members have expressed fear and uh, a reluctance to exercise their basic rights in the workplace. And so we've been conducting a lot of trainings and Know Your Rights workshops for our members to understand like how they can best protect themselves and their families during this time and what kind of resources are available to them not only through uh, legal referrals and legal support if needed, but also we're working in conjunction with a broader coalition to develop wellness programs and mental health support so that folks can be supported um, during this really trying time. What does Rock's affiliation with restaurant employers look like? How, How do they engage on behalf of their workers? The fact is that you can bring 10 restaurant workers to talk about an issue, but It only takes one employer to have the same kind of punch, you know, in speaking to that issue. And so ultimately, employers have a really, really huge privilege and um, responsibility in the industry. Now, what we found in our work at Rock is that progressive employers want to be that voice and they want to speak up and they want to put that effort forward. We organize these restaurant employers to come together, develop policy recommendations, and then speak on those recommendations to policymakers. Um, what we've been able to do here in L.A., for example, um, speaking back to that campaign that we worked on a couple of years ago that was very historic and helped to raise the minimum wage in Los Angeles and actually, and at the same time address wage theft is we mobilize several restaurant employers to actually be that voice and say, as a restaurant employer, I also stand for a higher minimum wage and I stand for holding bad employers accountable um, when there's wage theft going on because I care about this industry as well and it's important for, to me as an employer that my workers are being taken care of and supported. That was Kathy Huang, director of the Restaurant Opportunity Center in Los Angeles. You are listening to Making Contact. Thanks to generous support from listeners like you, this program is offered for free to radio stations in the U.S., Canada, Australia, and South Africa. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcast, go to radioproject.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. Coming up, we'll hear from author and union organizer Jane McAlevey with an examination of recent labor history and possible paths to greater worker empowerment. Now back to the show. The AFL-CIO is the nation's largest federation of unions whose members, according to their website, represent 12.5 million U.S. workers. In 1996, there was a shift in their leadership that set them on a new course. Author and union organizer Jane McAlevey talks about the significance of the change from the old guard to the new labor or new voices leadership. In the following segment, McAlevey describes what led to the change in leadership at the AFL-CIO, the trajectory of union organizing during new labor's first 20 years at the helm, and possible paths to greater worker empowerment in the U.S. The employers began to fight really hard, really hard in the, about 1973. Um, so up until 1973, organizing didn't seem that hard. You, sort of like the employers grew, your contracts spread, you grew with your employers. There was this happy social partnership between national unions and a lot of the employers. There was some fighting going on, but there was a, there was a period that was characterized as sort of labor peace, which it never was labor peace 
just to be super clear, ever. But at some major employers like the auto workers and some other places, you know, supermarket chains back in the old days in the 60s and 70s coming off the real strength of labor's real power in the 20s, mostly 30s and 40s and part of the 50s. You know, if the employer grew, sort of the union grew. That sort of worked until about 73 when capital decided that they were going to start really fighting back really hard, right? So we get through the 70s, and there's still some tremendous organizing going on in this country. There's a lot of strikes happening still. We hit the 80s, of course. Famously, PACO happens under Ronald Reagan, and he, what is PACO? It's essentially, you know, a defining strike where he says... Um, workers who go on strike can be permanently replaced, which essentially becomes the big challenge to labor. After that, a lot of unions just said, forget it. Well, we have no power anymore. Reagan said they can permanently replace striking workers. So that we're, 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 where this era is unfolding, where things are just getting worse, and it's not obvious to people. It's not like a sledgehammer hitting them yet, though it ought to have been, and for some it was. But the mainstream folks just kept thinking, hey, we're getting our deals, we're getting our raises, we're growing a little bit here and there. They hadn't had uh, a culture of organizing for many decades. So when the moment came to say it's time to organize again because density, which means the percentage of workers and unions in this country, has really taken a hit between the 70s and the 90s, they sort of weren't even, even if they wanted to organize and organize, they weren't really ready for it yet. They didn't have, the, they didn't have any of the sort of skills and abilities in-house uh, to really do it. Although the truth is, Every union is sitting on the best organizing leverage and the best organizing weapon that we have, which is the existing rank and file of every trade union. In the mid-90s, after the new labor leadership was elected, the AFL-CIO did something they'd never tried before. They set up a department dedicated to new worker organizing. But as Jane McAlevey explains, not everyone was on board with a top-down directive from the Federation. I said there's a set of unions who were trying to who actually be, got committed to the idea that we have to organize the unorganized. And there's really only ever been about 10 of them. The other 50 or so in the national AFL-CIO basically have never gone on this program for a whole variety of reasons. But I think the most simple one uh, is that um, if you do serious organizing, you unleash the possibility that you will lose the office that you hold as a union leader because you're bringing new people into the union. They may have new and different ideas. You have to contemplate your own electoral strategy for your re-election to national office. At a very fundamental level, I think they're the simplest argument for why unions fear doing organizing work of the unorganized in a serious way is because they're uh, most concerned about keeping the power that they hold inside of their union. Any new organizing threat, any new group of workers that's brought in, is potentially a threat to someone's existing incumbency. The new labor coalition did take over the leadership of the AFL-CIO in 96. But even before that happened, in the early 90s, labor was hoping for reform to come from the very top of the national political structure. And it didn't look promising. Clinton came in 92, then Gingrich led Republicans into Congress. For McAlevey, the error was labor's focus on electing Democratic Party leaders. Most of the unions thought they were signing on to having a better relationship because we were going to elect. I mean, this is really what's been happening for several decades. Labor leaders believe if we elect Democrats, contrary to all evidence forever, that if we elect the Democrats, they will enact labor law reform, and labor law reform will facilitate the kind of organizing that doesn't require you have to set up a whole department, and you don't have to think a whole lot about it, and you don't have to get your hands messy and go out and can have contentious fights with employers. And by the way, people are still having that fantasy today. There's a whole trajectory of people in the labor movement who still believe all we have to do is get the right Democrats elected, and we're going to have labor law reform. Now, just to go back in very recent history before we come back to what happened to the organizing model, this is, this is really crucial because as long as trade union leaders... And many of the staff in the trade unions believe that electing a Democrat uh, in, in going into Obama's race in 2007, I was still very deeply involved. In fact, I was on the International Executive Board, right, of SAU at the time. So privy to every conversation we were having about national electoral strategy, et cetera, were we going to endorse, who, why, whatever. And at the time, the dialogue went like this. All we have to do, this was Labor's rap, at the AFL-CIO and at SEIU, in 2006 and 2007, all we have to do is take the White House plus 60, meaning 60 veto-proof you know, votes in the U.S. Senate. And we would then win the labor law reform that labor had been promised since Taft-Hartley in 1947. And we didn't get under Jimmy Carter. And we didn't get under anyone. And we didn't get under Barack Obama. Because it takes way more power to move an agenda to have sort of radical labor law reform than it does to even try and win a local organizing campaign in a local facility. 
you can slit your throat waiting around for labor law reform, or you can decide that we have to do something very different in the organizing model and how we engage workers in this country and how we think about the class uh, and begin to do the hard work of rebuilding a bottom-up movement. We no longer have enough sort of political or social capital in this country to get almost anything done, except in a few states we can get a dollar raise for fast food workers. We can't actually get any power. We can't shift the power. We can't win labor law reform. So there isn't any choice but to go back to a very bottom-up organizing model. And there are places that we can look at and there are methods that we can use to do that. Looking at those methods meant examining the discussion around organizing after New Labor replaced the AFL-CIO Old Guard in 1996. The focus really begins to shift away from all the existing workplaces, this is among the new labor crowd, away from the existing rank and file members, away from servicing, but away from servicing, and a lot of progressives knew this early on, was a very dangerous thing to say. So even the framing of servicing existing members versus talking to unorganized workers to rebuild our base, it kind of sounded good, but if you got into the weeds of what it meant, it was actually quite a dangerous message. What I want to argue is, even within that, what di we did not evolve a real organizing model. We essentially evolved something that I'm saying is a mobilizing model. And to me, the debate we have to have in this country right now is organizing versus mobilizing. In a mobilizing model, it's a staff-driven model, and that's what evolved under New Labor. A staff-driven, staff-heavy model where staff's job was to go out and sort of mobilize people. Um, and the model shifted a little bit complicated. The model shifted into mobilizing, I argue, because by the late 1990s, the organizing wasn't going so well. Well, it's because the plan was bad, by the way. You couldn't move an organizing plan from the National AFL-CIO, and you couldn't compel the unions to do it, right? So organizing wasn't going that well. Conditions are a little bit rough. Organizing, it turns out, is really hard to do. So people sort of by the late 1990s at the, in the New Voices uh, unions kind of gave up on the idea and instead said we, can't, we can no longer win National Labor Relations Board elections. We actually can't win elections anymore. Um, we can't convince workers, we can't help workers understand that forming unions is a good idea because the boss's fight is too difficult. They fire people, they bring people in, they do all these horrible things, right? So instead of saying, well, what could we be doing differently to help workers understand why forming unions, why building and forming strong unions makes sense, we just said, you know what, let's, let's forget that. Let's, let's forget the worker uh, and let's find other sources of leverage so that we can um, force employers to come to the table to give us something called an agreement, an agreement for an election. You know, we say, um, part, if, you're, if you're really an organizer who wants to help uh, workers facilitate their own class struggle and their own liberation, we see our jobs as actually sort of just teaching, training, and coaching what we call the organic leaders, which is um, rank and file worker leaders in the existing workforce who already have the respect of their coworkers. We see our job as sort of identifying those workers and then coaching and teaching them how to sustain themselves through a really tough employer fight to come. Um, and that's, a, that's what bottom-up organizing is. That was Jane McAlevey, author and union organizer. McAlevey's most recent book is No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in the New Gilded Age. That wraps up this edition of Making Contact on labor organizing and worker rights in the U.S. To find out more about the people and organizations featured in today's program, check out our website at radioproject.org. That's also where you can download a copy of the show or get our podcast. Special thanks to this week's contributors, Doug Henwood and Paulina Velasco. Also, thanks for Paulina's editorial support on the show. Lisa Rudman is our executive director. Producers are Anita Johnson, Marie Chet, Monica Lopez, and RJ Lozada. Sabine Blazen is our audience engagement director. Development associate is Vera Tykolsker, and I'm Monica Lopez. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. This is Miguel Gavilan Molina inviting you to join us for a special day of programming celebrating the legacy of Cinco de Mayo. The 5th of May is a date of great importance for the Chicano Mexican communities. The date commemorates a military victory on May 5th, 1862. The Mexican people fought fiercely and won the Battle of Puebla against a highly trained and sophisticated regiment of 20,000 professional French soldiers. The significance of the 5th of May today commemorates a 
developing nation's resistance to the lending policies of wealthier nations. The 5th of May symbolizes the emergence of a national Latino identity forged through immigration, blood, sweat, and 